Picture this. You are a sentient bundle of neurons strapped precariously into a mech suit made of meat. Now, as a meat mech, patent pending, you pride yourself on the idea that your choices, your consciousness, are yours and yours alone. But free will is a construct, don't you know? And game designers like to deconstruct that construct to compel consumers into convivial comfort. This is a video about some of the ways game designers like to reach into our monkey brains and puppet them like some sort of deranged god. Then we're going to see if I can take those lessons and apply them to my own game, Strata, a 2D speedrunning platformer inspired by Ghost Runner and Celeste. We're going to lay the groundwork with some psychology and philosophy stuff, and then zoom way in to see how I applied these lessons to just a single checkpoint in one level of my game. Meet Paul. Paul is the product of millions of years of evolution. Throughout the entire known universe, Paul's brain and others like it are among the most complex objects we have ever seen. In addition, as an enjoyer of my videos and a clicker of buttons, Paul's brain is among the most advanced we have on the planet. Despite all that, Paul's genius level of intellect can be overcome very easily simply by showing him an animation of a number going up. You've probably heard of operant conditioning. Simply put, it's the idea that we can cause an organism to freely choose an action that we want by creating the expectation of a reward. Now, different rewards will work differently on different people. In Paul's case, he is spurred on by the idea of self-improvement. To him, seeing that new record text is enough to justify the hours of grinding that it took to get there. Jimothy, on the other hand, is an expressive wee bean. Her jam is customizing her character with the coolest hat and making sure everybody in the lobby sees it. In other words, Paul is intrinsically motivated, whereas Jimothy expects a concrete reward for her actions. What's interesting is when you kidnap both Paul and Jimothy and hook them up to an MRI machine, you'll notice that the moment they're most engaged isn't the moment where they finally get their reward. What we find is that people get more enjoyment from anticipating something than they do from actually experiencing that something. So let's play it out. Let's say we want to condition Jimothy to swipe her credit card. We know Jimothy likes hats, so the first thing we'll try is just letting her buy those hats outright. The first purchase feels pretty good, but since the outcome is predictable every time, we very quickly start to lose that feeling of anticipation. This is called attenuation. Basically, if we expose someone to the same stimulus over and over again, their response to that stimulus will decrease over time. That's why words lose all meaning after you've repeated them enough times, and why your life loses meaning once you hit 25. So is that it then? Is there just a hard limit on how engaging repeating one activity can be? Well that, my friend, is where this guy comes in. Meet B.F. Skinner, or as his friends know him, Skinner. What this guy did is he figured out that we can skirt around the whole attenuation problem by using what's called a variable reward schedule. Basically, Ratboy over here is directly responsible for the loot box ridden child gambling hellscape we find ourselves in today. So instead of giving Jimothy a new hat every time she makes a purchase, let's instead sell her a random hat box that might contain a hat. That way, she still gets the anticipation every time. Hell, let's go one step further. Why don't we secretly learn everything we can about Jimothy? Her thoughts, her feelings, her spending habits? Then we can use that information to silently tweak the odds so that she's always just one step closer to that next great hat. And I mean, in for a penny, in for a pound, right? Why don't we say, hey, do you want this legendary hat? Well, in order to get that legendary hat, you have to gain five very specific hat-related items. We'll give you the first few of those items free, super early on, so you'll get hooked. And I think you're just so close to getting that hat. What you don't know is that those last two hat parts are about a thousand times more rare than any of the other pieces. Meaning, you'd better open your wallet or grind for another hundred hours. 
because you wouldn't want to waste all that good luck you needed just to get to this point, now would you? Let's take a breath. The current AAA landscape that we find ourselves in, where the human experience has been boiled down to a perfect science, and teams of people are employed to understand everything they can about a player base, just to exploit that player base for more money. Well, sadly, that's what a lot of players think about when they hear terms like Skinner boxes or player conditioning. But psychology is a tool, just like any other, and the morality of that tool depends entirely on how it's used. So let's move away from modern AAA gaming for a moment and explore some of the ways ethical designers have used these tricks for the sole purpose of making their games more fun. Across the entire series, every Pokemon has had a range of hidden stats aimed at making them feel more unique on a mechanical gameplay level. It's the classic game design trick of starting with a modular system and then tweaking variables to add, well, variety. One stat I feel can be overlooked in that discussion is a Pokemon's catch rate. I'm going to assume most of you have played a Pokemon game at some point in your life, and by extension, have at least a few memories of spamming every last Pokeball you had at a Suicune or something, and just praying. Now take that memory and replace the random chance with a straightforward mechanical skill check. Like, maybe you could talk to this guy and learn that Suicune needs to either be burned or poisoned, and below 10 HP, but if the lead Pokemon is holding a shell bell and faints, then for the next five turns I don't need to burn it, but it'll flee after those five turns are up and... Like no, I'm eight. I'm gonna trap it, quick attack it a few times, and then spam it with an amount of Pokeballs roughly equivalent to the plastic that America uses in a nanosecond. Actually no, wait a second, that, that feels kinda mean. That's better, to have a 95% chance of catching Suicune under normal circumstances, you would need to use an amount of Pokeballs equivalent to the plastic that America uses in 33 milliseconds. At its most basic level, a game is just a conversation between the designer and the player. What randomness does is it essentially adds a third element to that equation where both players and designer have some influence over it, but the final outcome is out of their hands. It basically adds engagement by taking control away from the player. But this medium is all about interactivity, so surely by diminishing the player's capacity to act on the game, we're taking away fun? Well, interactivity in games has two components. There is acting on and reacting to. In deterministic or non-random games, players can reach a point where there's no longer anything to react to. They know exactly what's coming every time, and it's just down to them to execute their run perfectly. In random or non-deterministic games, however, the game is always acting on you through randomness. In games like Spelunky, mastery comes from understanding the game's underlying systems so you can effectively react to the random number generator. Now, you can make a game in any genre for any target audience and have it be anywhere from fully deterministic to fully chaotic. There are plenty of reasons to do both. It's just that all the operant conditioning stuff I've covered so far assumes we have some access to randomness. Now, as a mediocre speedrunner and person making a speedrunning game, I love deterministic gameplay. But if there's no randomness in a game, shouldn't the joy and anticipation wear off? Why is it that SM64 is still the most popular speedrun game after 20 years? Well, let's take a look at the big three of dashing, pressing crouch, and then jumping. Those games are Celeste, Strata, and Ghost Runner. Okay, yeah, not gonna lie, Strata is gonna need a few more years in the oven before it's even a contender for a spot on that list. 
that being said, I genuinely do think the core gameplay is strong enough that with the resources, the game really could swing with the big boys one day. If you want to find out whether I'm delusional or not, the first demo is up on itch right now. It's short and it's free. But in these games, the variable reward comes from our own inherent randomness. Now, some of the more nerdy among you may be thinking, but YouTube man, computers can't do true randomness anyway. They just create the illusion of randomness through variable inputs and chaotic systems. And if that's you, gold star for paying attention. It's true. Computers are by definition deterministic machines. But hold on to your hats, because I'm about to mesh game design, computer science, and armchair philosophy into a thunk so big it might just collapse on itself and wipe out life as we know it. Computers are input-output machines that, through scale and complexity, can create the illusion of complex behaviors like free thought and decision-making. Brains are input-output machines that, through scale and complexity, can create the sensation of complex behaviors like free thought and decision-making. Now, I just skipped over, like, all of determinist philosophy. Go watch Philosophy Tube. But the point I'm clumsily shuffling towards is this. As far as games are concerned, there is no randomness. Neither the game nor the player is capable of generating true randomness. All randomness in games is just the result of systems with inputs so obscure and logic so complex that we can only perceive the outcome as random. The only difference, therefore, between deterministic and non-deterministic games is how much we understand the systems driving them. The early Pokemon games are functionally random, but if you're a speedrunner or competitive team builder, you know that the game's entire RNG system is based on how many frames have passed since the game loaded. So tweaking catch rates in Pokemon achieves exactly the same thing as tweaking individual jumps in a platformer level. They both harness randomness to create a curve that is, on average, well-paced. Pacing is an issue that came up a lot during playtest sessions. This was especially true among players who weren't particularly experienced with this type of game. And in hindsight, I can definitely understand why. The pacing in level 1 was great for most players. It's a nice, gentle intro, followed by a quick difficulty spike, and then we finish. It's short, and it flows nicely. The problems lay in level 2. The pacing was described as oppressive, and I was told I needed to give the players more room to breathe. And they were right. Intuitively, we could all feel that something was just wrong with the way this level was paced. But if I wanted to fix it, I needed to get a much deeper understanding of what pacing is and what I can do to influence it. In psychology, the term arousal, get your mind out of the gutter, describes the brain's level of activity and preparedness. It's basically our way of responding to the stimuli in our surroundings. If our surroundings are stressful, for example if we perceive danger, our minds go into a state of increased alertness. Our senses get sharper, and in simple terms, we process information at an increased speed. Arousal in itself does not imply positive or negative feelings. It simply describes how much we are experiencing, and how fast or slow our brains are primed to work. In the same vein, we have the idea of stress. Like arousal, the term stress has connotations in casual conversation that are different from its literal meaning. This is Hans Selye. This guy's basically the guy when it comes to our theoretical understanding of stress, so he seems like a good person to ask. Um, excuse me, Mr. Selye. How make game good? Damn, must have just missed him. I guess I'll have to paraphrase a wiki or something. Normally, when we think of stress, we do so in one dimension. You're either not very stressed, or you're very stressed. But there's actually a second axis, and that has to do with the effect that stress has on you. So when you're overstimulated and having a bad time, that's distress. If you're just the right amount of stimulated, however, that's where eustress comes in. Wait a second, this graph looks familiar. Let me just... That's right, baby, we've come full circle. 
stress theory and flow theory are closely interlinked. If I want to keep my players in that all-important flow state, I need to carefully modulate the amount of stress they're under. That's where the first iteration of level 2 fell short. It's not just that the difficulty was too high, it's that I was asking players to spend too long in this part of the graph and not giving them enough time to chill on the lower end between challenges. So we had a lot of anticipation, but by not paying off that anticipation in the early stages, I'd quickly see that anticipation turn into frustration. This gauntlet of challenges left players feeling distressed, overwhelmed, and not sufficiently rewarded for their efforts. Celeste, by contrast, has much harder challenges even in its second level, but it succeeds where I failed because it does the legwork of building that relationship with the player where they know they get to feel good after beating a tough challenge. It's extremely rare for a Celeste screen to leave you thinking, God, I'm glad that's over. But this section, this damn section, just frustrated the hell out of my friends. The idea behind Strata is I wanted to take the advanced speedrunning mechanics of games like Ghost Runner and Celeste and use those as the core design pillar of an entire game. One of the major challenges I've faced is introducing these concepts to the player organically through play. If someone's never heard of a slide jump before, how can I create challenges that teach it in a fun and engaging way? Learning something like this is going to be a lot to ask of a new player. And right here is where I ask them to do that. I throw them down this pit, strip them of their double jump and their dash, and challenge them to teach themselves how to slide jump in order to progress. If the player entered this oppressive space when they're already feeling frustrated, they'd probably bounce right off the game and quit. So I need to have them come in feeling confident in their abilities. Enter level two, checkpoint five. We start with a jump into some angled bounce pads. This jump requires you to use both double jump and dash in the air with good timing. If you're successful, it launches you straight into the next obstacle with no time to rest. Then here, you're supposed to come to the realization that double jump can still be used after dashing, and it can sometimes be more useful to double jump rather than dash in certain situations. So this wall jump section is at a steep angle. My hope was that players would fail a few times by trying to dash, and then realize it was trivially easy if you can get to here while still having your double jump. So that's a lot of learning in a very short amount of time, but we're not done yet. Because while I do let you rest here, you don't get a checkpoint. Instead, we go straight into this Kung Fu Panda moment where you have to dash under this falling block, double jump midair, and then wall jump twice before the block falls away. Fail any of this, and you have to go all the way to the start of this bit you just struggled through for five minutes. One playtester just refused to quit, which is a behavior I want to encourage, but in this case her refusal to quit the challenge just led to her getting frustrated. Eventually I had to step in and show her how to do it. In the real world, if I wasn't in the room with her, she probably would have put the game down. Pacing wise, level 1 was a good introduction to the game, allowing players to move through it at their own speed. And of course, I wanted to ramp up the difficulty in level 2 now that my players were familiar with the basic mechanics of the game. But the problem was that my reward schedule was like, really not good. As I kept playtesting and revising, level 2 spawn point 5 kept getting easier and easier. In the final version of the demo, this level is much nicer for both beginner players and speedrunners looking for a challenge. I'm going to show you three key decisions I made that helped me take this frustrating section and turn it into something that was expressive and rewarding and more in line with what I wanted for the rest of the game. Firstly, players kept standing here and trying to jump up rather than going with the intended solution of sliding down this wall. So in this case, removing a safe surface actually made the challenge easier since there was less confusion about what the player was expected to do. Second, this opening felt bad. There was only one route through it, which sucked to speedrun, and for new players it could easily be overwhelming 
when being asked to do that much in a row with no downtime. So I killed two birds with one stone by swapping out these slanted bounce pads for horizontal ones. Now, not only does the player get some partially safe ground to stand on while they collect themselves, but a flat surface is much easier to hit than one that's angled away from you. I also made this jump way shorter. It used to be that you had to use both your abilities to make it. Bringing it in allowed for different approaches depending on what the player was most comfortable with. To balance out this reduction in difficulty, I added an alternative path for speedrunners that can save either a little or a lot of time depending on how well you execute it. So already this section has been improved massively for all types of players. People also weren't really understanding that they were supposed to dash here to get over these spikes and then save their double jump. There's this great video by a channel called Let's Talk Game Design where the host talks about using spikes not as an actual threat to the player, but as a perceived threat that guides them away from bad solutions. So I added these spikes up here that are totally out of reach and basically impossible to hit, but they create the feeling of having to squeeze through a tight space, which should subconsciously guide the player towards the option that doesn't move them closer to the spikes. Now this last obstacle is designed to be a big set piece moment where the player expresses agency over the environment by deliberately triggering this falling block then dodging it with a dash, and double jumping up to a series of tight wall jumps. Originally, the falling block would just barely give you enough time to climb up, but I realized during playtesting that this felt arbitrarily precise. All the players should need to do here is prove that they can use all the mechanics I've shown them so far. They absolutely should not have to have mastered wall jumping this early on. So I stretched this guy to give the player enough time to mess up the wall jump once or twice and still make it through. Lastly, I put a spawn point here. I think letting the player retry this one instantly lets it feel much more cinematic. The player gets to try different ideas with almost no punishment. That may be something I change in the future if I think the longer buildup would make your eventual triumph hit harder. Now that's just one level section out of about 30. If I want Strata to be as good as it can be, I have to give that level of care to every platform, hazard, and interactable in the entire game. I think that would be a bit much for a YouTube series, but I'll be sharing a lot more of this level design stuff over on Patreon. Supporters also get access to new levels as I'm making them, so if you want more Strata or just want to support what I do, the link is down in the place. As always, a massive thank you to all the people who take the time to cast their vote to the great YouTube algorithm gods. I'm trying to graduate from lowly bartender with a music degree to full-time artist. So you guys taking a few extra seconds just to pad my engagement stats really does go a long way. I hope you found this 20 minute rant insightful, engaging, calming, relaxing, or whatever metrics YouTube is currently using to recommend new content. Anyway, uh, video over. Bye.